Welcome back to the Indian Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Raj Balkaran. More importantly, you, you are looking for living wisdom teachings you can apply to your everyday life. Now, a couple of folks have asked about this idea of living wisdom and what that means. The difference between um, knowledge in um, an insentient way is that one understands the way a computer understands. <laughs> Um, living wisdom has to do with the realization, with the embodied realization of the truth of the teaching of the verse. That knowledge lives quite literally in the consciousness of the person in whom it is awakened. It is palpable when one is receiving a transmission from someone, however bright and well-intentioned, who is reading and or regurgitating versus when one is receiving a transmission from one who has realized the truth of what they're talking about. Now, on a much more mundane level, the power of story in terms of personal story speaks precisely to this point. Because, for example, um, Many people struggle with addictions, and addictions are tricky. Medical science doesn't quite know what to do with alcoholism, for example, because, of course, there's a, there's a neurophysiological dimension to it. Of course, there is a anomaya kosha, physical body dimension to um, chemical dependency. But it's also um, something that occurs on a deeper level. The vasana, or the compulsion, happens on the level of the psyche, which is uh, fundamentally mysterious. Um, and the ways in which um, uh, Western psychology speak about the psyche are insightful in some ways and quite limiting in others. Whereas Indic thought has posits many more layers to our being, which for the attentive observer seem to tally well. The koshas, for example, the manas versus the buddhi, that is, the, the mind, the emotional, sensory mind versus the intellect. Yes? And so part of what um, medical science recommends for the treatment of, for example, alcoholism is AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, there is something to be said about the power of community and support without question, even as, <laughs> as long ago as the time of the Buddha, 2,500 years ago, he said, well, you have three refuges you know, the spiritual path is difficult. So people are going to think you're nuts. Well, you might be nuts as well, but either way, uh, <laughs> you have three refuges. Take refuge in Dharma um, Sharanam Gachami. I take refuge in the teachings, in the Dharma. I take, refuges, I take refuge in the Buddha or the exemplar or the guru, the teacher, the exemplar, the teachings. Third, Sangam Sharanam Gachami uh, in the community. So there is something to be said about the power of community and the support of community and like-minded people. This is really, really important. But above and beyond that, what is absolutely transformative from what I understand about the AA process is the power of personal story. When people get together and share their embodied living wisdom about what worked for them in terms of assuaging the alcoholism, in terms of changing their life around in some sense. It's not just an idea in a book. There's a transmission that occurs with the telling of a story that you've lived. And that story is that transmission, that living wisdom is so powerful. It has the ability to really energize and inspire others towards that. I mean, the examples are endless. What did Oprah Winfrey do? Why is she famous? Why is she a billionaire? On one level, it's as simple as this. She understood the power of lived experience and stories, and she created space for people to tell their stories. Right. So this is a, a much more mundane manner in which we can see that the, that the wisdom or the experience lives in the body of the person who experiences it. Now, similarly, if we have a concept from, say, the Yoga Sutras, 
uh, about um, yoga is the cessation of the fluctuation of mind. Great. That kind of makes sense if you think about it and you understand how the mind works. It's very different when one has had that experience or has uh, an understanding on an experiential level of what that means. Then the seer abides in its own state. Well, if one has never experienced the seer or the witness, well, we've all experienced it. We, we, we've all caught whiffs here, you know, little fragrance of rose on the air, little little whiff of biryani around the corner. <laughs> but have we sat down and dined at that restaurant? That's a different story altogether. We've all caught whiffs of the witness because we've all been able to witness ourselves grow over the years. And there are moments in conversations where we are able to suppress our instinct and our impulse and our reactivity um, in favor of just watching, watching self, watching others. But when this watching power grows and grows and grows to a thousand times what it currently is at right now, then one has a palpable sense of the seer abiding in its own state, because that seer does not abide in your home <laughs> or your car <laughs> or your workplace. That seer abides in a ground of awareness that is tantamount to being itself. Seeing equals being. Being equals seeing. Oh, wow. What are you, Dr. Seuss now? No, I'm Dr. Raj. But either way, <laughs> these might be silly, these might be captivating, or these might be deeply resonant, pending your capacity to receive and pending the extent to which you've had an experience of what is being talked about. So this is what, what is meant by living wisdom. And one way that living wisdom is propagated uh, in ancient India and all things uh, Indic is through lineages, student-teacher lineages, uh, student uh, guru-shisha relationship, the student-teacher relationship. There's a lot about that relationship that is readily understandable and accessible and makes sense. There's a lot about that relationship that is difficult and next to impossible to properly establish in a modern Western context. And there's a lot about that relationship that is absolutely esoteric and will not make sense to anyone unless they've had the good fortune of being initiated in such a relationship. But nevertheless, the transmission from a living master to a proper vessel. This is something that one cannot begin to convey to another unless one has experienced this, right? So the wisdom lives, right? It, 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 it's sentient in a sense. It's, it's pulsating with, with life force, with prana. And this is more than just poetic rendering of an experience. This is meant quite literally that the Vidya lives and even has agency. So this is living wisdom. Ideas we can get. We're in the information age. Well, into the information age. We can all download a copy of the Bhagavad Gita in the blinking of an eye. We can all download a copy of a translation of the Yoga Sutras in the blinking of an eye. But what then? We read it and then we wake up? No. See, if self-help was, uh, self-help can be quite useful for to a great many people, of course. But if it was an overarching efficacious, efficacious paradigm, a pedagogical paradigm, uh, it would be a shrinking industry <laughs> because people would get the help they need and they'd move on. It's a growing industry because ideas beget ideas, beget ideas, beget ideas. But how do you separate the wheat from the chaff? How do you apply the ideas that are required for you to transform your consciousness and therefore your life? Anyhow, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I want to tell the tale, a tale, of uh, a beloved deity named Ganesha, the elephant-headed god. Now, my instinct is that people have been worshipping Ganesha <laughs> and Hanuman, for that matter, in South Asia for perhaps as long as there have been elephants and monkeys <laughs> in South Asia. Um, 
but they eventually get uh, assimilated into uh, or mythologized as part of Vaishnava and Shaiva traditions, respectively. That is, uh, Ganesha is part of sort of Shiva and Shiva's family, and Hanuman uh, ends up becoming part of Vishnu and uh, Vishnu's sort of entourage. But Ganesha, this 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 elephant-headed deity who is lord of wisdom itself and auspicious beginnings, which is so very wise because what else do we want to begin with? What else renders the beginning auspicious if not wisdom? <laughs> Can an unwise seed render wise fruit? I don't know. Actually, I do, but you know, <laughs> that's more of a that's more of a teaching question <laughs> for you to ponder and percolate and answer. Um, answer in your own manner in your own time so there is a uh, charming and perhaps even disturbing story <laughs> about how ganesha got his elephant head what needs to be understood is that these tales are mythologizations of spiritual truths and realities and once one understands uh what is being talked about. And of course, they're not meant to be uh, linear or monolithic. There might be a number of levels of interpretation. Actually, uh, mythic narratives um, purposefully operate on a great many levels and purposefully um, play with paradox, which is why they are um, so long-lived. Because these grand mythic narratives pertain to slow burning aspects of uh, homo sapien existence that will probably be still in vogue in five or 10,000 years. Questions and issues that we will still be grappling with, such as the power of myth. So Shiva and poverty, Shiva and poverty. You all know Shiva, the mountain man, the yogi. He's made many a cameo appearance upon this podcast. But aside from this whole mountain man yogi thing, he has this other side of uh, uh, beloved of poverty, you know, the, the divine love of, uh, of, of poverty's life, so to speak. It's a two way street, obviously. And um, perhaps a little bit, um, a little bit reluctant, but nevertheless, a family man. They have two sons, Ganesha and Kartikeya. Kartikeya is much more popular in, in South Indian contexts, um, also known as Skanda or Murugan. And these two children of Shiva and Parvati have rich, rich, rich symbologies and rich uh, narratives of their own. But today we'll focus on Ganesha. The marriage of Parvati and Shiva, though blessed, was never simple. As much as Shiva adored Parvati, his first love was, you got it, yoga. He was always off meditating, seeking higher and higher levels of attainment. And though she loved him with all her heart, waiting for eons on end for Shiva to complete his meditative practices was, you know, a bit challenging even for Parvati. And Parvati, you know, makes Job look impatient, really, when it comes to Shiva. Um, <laughs> she knew better than to disrupt his trances you know there were a couple of times when she'd send him text messages and she was annoyed when she didn't get a response within a couple hours or a day or two but at this point she knew him well enough that a couple of millennia is you know he's you know his uh his phone is in airplane mode he has taken off he is gone he's in the stratosphere <laughs> so she knew better than to disrupt his trances right but on one occasion, after uh, a millennia or two had elapsed, her, her loneliness got the better of her. What she really longed for was deep connection. And there are many facets of connecting. Sometimes we're looking for love in all the wrong places, or maybe different kinds of love. Uh, or, you know, sometimes we're looking for love, and we don't realize we're looking for love, and we chase lust or power or money or who knows what, convenience. <laughs> um, she understood that there were many ways to love and all very deeply fulfilling, potentially. So she actually longed for a child. She wanted to experience parental love. So she is, after all, the mother of the universe, Prakriti itself, material creation itself 
nature, if you will. Have a look at nature. Nature propagates itself by itself. Actually, the word for matter in English is obviously um, related to uh, mothru, you know, through the Latin, right? Mother, right? <laughs> mother matter. <laughs> Prakriti is mother matter. <laughs> Uh, I so love the the glories of the goddess that I studied because what they do is they turn the idea that Prakriti is subservient and um, secondary to Purusha spirit on its head. And the glories of the goddess of Devi Mahatmya say, look, Mother Matter is the source of all things. Anyhow, she didn't need any help. You know, the ancients understood that the feminine represented fecundity and... Um, Really, the, the narrative that we see in, in Genesis is very much a reaction to this innate wisdom in terms of let us create uh, a, 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 a universe, a, a story verse, where everything comes from the masculine and the masculine alone, not even through masculine feminine copulation, but the masculine and masculine alone. Now we have ancient myths, for example, in ancient Egypt where um, Isis, <laughs> the goddess Isis, conceives Horus with the corpse of her husband, Osiris, right? So the feminine does the heavy lifting with respect to procreation. So goes most of the, the symbology. And so what does she do to procreate? She just scra you know, scrapes a little bit of skin off of her arm and boom, throws a little shakti into it. Bippity boppity boom. She's got a son. A son named Ganesha. Such is the power of the divine feminine, source of all life, the creatrix, the creatrix of all things. Hers is the power of Maya magic, the power of manifestation, the power to bring forth many. When at first there was only one, such is the power of Prakriti. She mystically produced her son from her own body. The feminine is the primordial. It comes first. We all have an X chromosome, don't we? <laughs> Parvati was deeply at home in motherhood and she was overjoyed not only was she the mother of all creation but now she had a child of her own a point of focus for the full breadth of her oceanic love in the blinking of an eye Ganesha grew through boyhood into his youth he was devoted to his mother so when she called on him one day with a special task he happily obliged she said Ganesha I'm going to go bathe out in the waterfall behind our mountain shack. Would you please guard the door so that no one comes in while I'm bathing? And she was young and proud and like probably not dissimilar to a great many adolescents. And he was so happy to have this responsibility and when she says, make sure that no one trespasses while I'm gone, um, he goes, okay, no one shall pass. I'll do my duty. The goddess smiled lovingly and disappeared out of sight. As fate would have it, at that very moment, the mountains rumbled with the awakening of Shiva, the great yogi, awakening from his divine trance, his divine deliberations as meditations as ideations upon being as his awareness returned to his body he arose and his mind turned to thinking of his beautiful wife he eagerly descended onto his abode expecting to find her there of course but as he approached he noticed a rather haughty looking youth standing to attention at the entrance uh, Shiva was really eager to see the love of his life, and so he commanded the kid to step aside. But Ganesha replied, You cannot pass. <laughs> Shiva tried for a second time. Step aside, he shouted. But Ganesha was steadfast, intent on guarding his mother's abode, replying, You cannot pass. In the blinking of an eye, Shiva pulled out his sword, decapitated the arrogant lad, breathed a sigh of relief to be done with that nonsense and entered as a boat. <laughs> Parvati had finished her bath out back 
Just as Shiva arrived and was delighted to see him, they embraced in divine ecstasy, and Parvati excitedly proclaimed, Shiva, my darling, I'm so glad you're home, and especially glad that you've had a chance to meet our son Ganesha. He was just outside, guarding the front door for me when you arrived. Shiva was aghast. He turned a pale, pale shade of white. The poverty was intrigued, confused, a little unsettled. She knew that something had happened. And Shiva knew he had no choice but to tell his wife what had happened. Parvati was devastated and then enraged and demanded that he go out immediately into the world and find a replacement head for their son. So Shiva departed, his tail between his legs, so to speak, in sort of a pensive, trepidatious mood, reflecting upon both his trigger-happy tendencies towards violent outbursts, and also upon how he would solve this problem, what head would be procured. As he wandered the countryside ruminating on past mistakes, <laughs> Shiva came across an elephant. It's the first creature he saw. His instinct was simply to lop off the creature's head, uh, but as he approached it, he caught himself in the sudden glare of his own awareness. You know, these vasanas, our vasanas, our tendencies just kind of carry us away, but can we catch Can we catch the pattern? Can we change course? Can we grow? He reined himself in, knowing this time he must take a more measured approach and to break the habit of decapitating first and facing the consequences later. So Shiva explained his plight to the attentive elephant who responded, with astonishing composure. Is that all, Lord Shiva? By all means, then, they sever my head. Install it upon your son's body. You would so willingly surrender your head, elephant? Shiva asked. I have lived a long, long time, Lord, and learned a lot in all that time. For not only have I lived... I've lived a worthy life, according to Socrates, <laughs> because it was a life of examination. The unexamined life is not worth living. And I've watched a long, long time. And death is certain for all creatures. All of us here in the goddess's creation are sure to die. But you offer me an opportunity to live on as part of your son. This is a rare, rare chance indeed. It is not whether I die, it is when I die. And if I die now, I will actually transcend death. Only a fool would pass up such a chance. This is a rare, rare chance. Much more than any elephant could dream of. Please accept my head. In grateful service to the Lord. Shiva was so humbled by the wisdom of this creature. He blessed the elephant, liberating him from rebirth as he accepted his offering and returned to his abode. He affixed the head of the elephant to the body of his son and breathed new life into him. Ganesha's eyes, his new eyes, were opened. His vision was clear and calm, supported by the wisdom of the great elephant. He now saw what he could not see before. He recognized Shiva, Purusha, spirit, divinity, or the great Lord that he was. And he asked for forgiveness for his arrogance. Shiva, in turn, asked forgiveness for his own mistake. The goddess beamed. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Shiva learned something. Ganesha learned something. Does the goddess learn something? We don't know. Did she orchestrate all of this? We don't know. Such is the mystery of Maya. The goddess beamed and all rejoiced in her mystery and majesty in the divine play whereby both her husband and son learned humility, graced by the wisdom of the great elephant. When we surrender our mundane heads to the divine, to be divinely decapitated, think of, for example, um, well, Shiva does his fair share of decapitating, but think of Kalima, garland of skulls. This is divine decapitation. 
It's the decapitation of the ego. So when we surrender our mundane heads to be divinely decapitated, as the elephant does in the story, we see through the goddess's material play and can recognize the spirit of Shiva wherever we go. Shiva and the goddess are ultimately one, two sides of the same cosmic coin, but separate in order to experience the ecstasy of uniting. Deluded by materiality, we see others as separate from ourselves, like a head separated from a body. But when blessed with the vision of the wise, we see separation as the illusion that blocks the light of spiritual union. Ah, I've hoped you've enjoyed this tale, a fraction, an umsha, as much as I've enjoyed telling it. And truly hope more so that there's some food for thought there. Who that can be digested and assimilated as part of you and so therefore live within you. Until next time, keep well, keep listening. Feel free to reach out if I may be of service. Namaste.